historical background of Jesus' temptation story is that same story that Abigail shared with us in part, the story of the Israelites traveling out of Egypt, wandering about in the desert for 40 years. And so Jesus is, is, is in that shadow, if you will, in that backdrop after his baptism and filled with the Holy Spirit, led by the Spirit, he goes out into the wilderness. And for 40 days, Jesus is tempted by the devil. We, we hear the three separate temptations, but for 40 days, Jesus was being tempted. And we don't even know how many times that he was confronting the powers that were trying so desperately to pull him off track. The Gospel writer tells us that Jesus was starving. Starving. Not just hungry, that he was starving. Being hungry was also the problem of the Israelites who got them in trouble. And they were tempted in all different directions. You might remember that at one point the Israelites that we were grumbling against Moses and Aaron, and they said, and right there in Scripture it reads, If only we had died by the Lord's hand in Egypt, there we sat around pots of meat and ate all the food we wanted. But you, O oh Moses, you have brought us out here into this desert to starve us, this entire assembly, to death. Hmm. You can tell at that point these hungry Israelites were being tempted. And what had taken control of them was their stomach. They were thinking way back to the oppression they were living under in Egypt. They could have at least had something to eat if you left us there to die, Moses, instead of taking us out. I can relate to being hungry. I cannot relate to being one who is starving. But I'll tell you that I'm not my finest when I'm hungry. Right? All of us are probably like that. Some of us are a little bit more sensitive to, to hunger than others. But when I'm hungry, I can tolerate it for a while, but uh, after a while, I get a little cranky. I want something to eat. Maybe it's my sugar levels. I don't know what it is. Maybe it's just my being spoiled, being used to being fed and, and, and taken care of. I can't imagine for fasting more than a day. I've only fasted for 24 hours. I have not fasted for longer than that. But I've been told that it gets easier when you fast longer than 24 hours. But I do know that it changes who I am. So Jesus, in his physically weakened state of hunger, he's being tempted on a daily basis. And we need to pay attention to that for ourselves, on a daily basis. The powers that seek to bring us outside of the path of God's will are not part-time. Some say 24-7, it's just ever-present. This is the world that we live in. The powers are, are, are tempting us on a daily basis. And, and every day the devil for Jesus is trying, is trying to get him to reject the way that God has set for him. That's all that the devil wants to do. Come on to my side, Jesus. You can do good things. You can be a good person. But just come on over to my side. The devil is trying to undo God's work. And as Eugene Peterson writes in one of his books, the devil is the ultimate disincarnation. Incarnation, of course, is Jesus Christ in human form. Right? God comes in human form. Born into human form, lives into human form. Well, the devil is the disincarnation. If you want to know what, what, what the opposite of incarnation is, the devil is disincarnation. Everything but God is human form. In other words, the devil is the complete opposition to God. The devil does not want to have us in any way connected to the will and the way of the God that we know and love. The God, well, let me say this, the devil is no slouch when it comes to good ideas, so the devil's always thinking of, of sharp possibilities and ideas and notions that would, would pull us away from the God we love and know. The devil, this morning, is even a scholar in terms of scripture and has memorized scripture. 
So we say the devil works 24-7 at getting us to detour off the Jesus way. Get us to detour off the Jesus way. And one of the devil's creative detours is, is working the soil of the heart by planting seeds of doubt. Jesus in the parable of the sower talks about the different types of soil that the word is thrown out to. You know the story where the, the soil is, is not always prepared for the seed. Sometimes it's, it's not harrowed deep enough. And sometimes it's a hard path. And sometimes it's a place where the birds pick it up. And, but there are places where the soil is prepared and it, that seed takes place. Old and the harvest is just unbelievable. Well, I can imagine, and maybe you too can, can imagine that the devil works the same soil. As a matter of fact, if you go back to this parable and you read it carefully, you find out that the seed only takes hold 25%. Three types of soil do not produce any harvest. The good soil that does produce harvest is an incredible harvest, a harvest that would probably take to replace all those failed attempts. But, but my point here is to notice that, that somehow that word doesn't take hold in three quarters of the soil. And so I imagine that maybe the devil is working the same soil, and if you, if you look at the percentage in terms of where the seed actually takes hold, the devil is doing better. That's the power. 75% of that soil doesn't produce. 25 guns, but it produces a, such a bountiful harvest. The seeds of the gospel only take hold in good soil. But friends, the seeds of doubt take hold in any soil. But remember always, when the seeds of the gospel take hold, they produce a harvest that is unbelievable. After finishing every temptation, the scripture tells us, the devil departed from Jesus until the next opportunity. I don't really believe that the devil had to wait very long for another opportunity. At least the powers that I know, they're always knocking at my door. I don't know about you. I know from my own personal experience that opportunities abound for the devil to do the devil's work. The powers of evil to do the powers of evil's work. The powers that want to separate you and me from the love of Christ, they're always available. The effort to undo God's work is happening all the time. All the time. The scholar N.T. Wright defines sin. That's what we're talking about, sin. He defines sin in his book titled Evil and Justice of God as the rebellion of humankind, I quote, the rebellion of humankind against the vocation to reflect God's image in the world. Let's think of sin that way as it's a rebellion of us. We rebel against that, that, that task, that job that we've been employed by God to do to reflect God's image into the world. And so when we're, we're not reflecting God's image into the world, we're in sin. When the seeds of doubt are planted and not tended to, we begin to see the seeds of faithlessness. That's rebellion. When we're not dealing with those seeds of doubt that are planted, and maybe letting them take hold, whereas the seeds of the gospel, when they do get planted, maybe they don't take hold as fast or at all. We live in this conflict. We ourselves, we find ourselves, when the seeds of doubt take, take hold of us, and that we find ourselves turning against God's will for our own interests. We, we as humans, we do that. We are selfish. We are self-oriented. That's, that's who we are. And the struggle that we live with as people of God is, is to reorientate ourselves, to, to turn, as Jesus calls us, to be selfless. And what the devil wanted Jesus to do is is to do that, to, to turn away from God, to, to look at Jesus, look at Jesus, look at, look at what you need, Jesus, as the powers of evil. Turn away from God's will and turn toward yourself, Jesus. And so we go back to that first temptation. I wish I had a rock up here. I could talk to it. I could, I could say, Jesus, as the devil said to Jesus, since you are God's son, command this stone to become a loaf of bread. The devil went right for what Jesus was feeling. 
I imagine Jesus, this is just my biblical imagination, forgive me, but I can imagine Jesus staring down at this big, loaf-sized rock. And could smell the fresh bread that his mother or his grandmother or baker would be. And he's staring at that loaf. Maybe that, that rock, even in, a, in his hunger, in his in his starvation, he, he starts to hallucinate a little bit and sees that, that, that loaf of bread starting to rise up. And, oh, he can start to taste it. He can say, oh, it's going to be so good. And he stops. <laughs> the hunger Jesus felt was not going to be satisfied. It was not going to be dealt with with this false sense of satisfaction that, 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 that the devil was offering and Jesus draws upon God's word reply to the devil right out of Deuteronomy that story that Abigail shared with me says people won't live only by bread right? people will not live only by bread Jesus is speaking to that Deep, 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 deep hunger that's in the hearts and minds of God's people. Yes, we need to nourish our bodies and strengthen our bodies. We need our daily bread. That's why we pray for it and give thanks for it. But there's another hunger, and that's, that's the soil that the seeds of doubt and the seeds of faith get planted in. I with you know that we cannot live on bread alone. But on every word that comes from the mouth of the Lord, says Deuteronomy, Jesus quoted part of that scripture. And surely the powers that were trying to separate Jesus from God's will and way knew the rest of it. But on every word that comes from the mouth of the Lord, Yes, it would have been a good thing for Jesus to have taken care of his hunger. It would have been a good thing to, to quiet down those pains that he had deep in his stomach. It, it would have been a good thing because Jesus would have satisfied his own hunger, and then maybe he would have just went on and, and satisfied the hunger of the rest of the world, just making sure everybody had something to eat. And, but what would have happened? He would have dedicated the rest of his life making sure all who were without food had something to eat. Not a, not a bad thing, but that, that's not what God's will was for him at that time. That, that was not the call that he was answering. Jesus would provide food for hungry. Jesus would encourage his followers to provide food for the hungry. Yes, that is part of the ministry, but Jesus was not going to give in to the way of the devil and forfeit the true calling that he had as the Son of God. Eugene Peterson again warns us, and I quote, the temptation is to define life in consumer terms and, and then devise plans and programs to accomplish them in, in Jesus' name. And so that Jesus, yeah, could have said yes to the devil and turned that loaf that rock into a loaf of bread and then got on and then that ministry, that great ministry of feeding people. But then it would have been just feeding people, just feeding people for the sake of quieting those pains of hunger, which is important. But there's more to it. There's more to it, brothers and sisters. There's more to the ministry of Jesus Christ. Peterson warns us not to provide food. This is where we bring it home. He provides... Peterson's warning is not to provide food for the hungry just because they are hungry consumers, but to provide food for our neighbors because they are people of God. There's a difference. When we serve the hungry as consumers, we become nothing different than a provider. Nothing different than a provider. We, when I say we, I, I say that in the context of the church, the body of Christ, when, when we simply provide food to the, the hungry and we, we look at them as consumers, as those who come to just eat food, just to fill their, their stomachs, we, we become nothing different than a, than a good, and I'm not criticizing those who provide food for food's sake, that is no way am I criticizing, it's important, it needs to be done, but the church has a different role and a different job, in a different call, in a different purpose. You see, that's what the, the devil is trying to get 
Jesus to pull out of that, that place where God had called him to be, a different purpose, a different being, a different uh, a, a, a Messiah, Savior, trying to get him to become a provider of sorts, and to step away. And so when we serve the hungry, let's not lose our identity as the baptized community. And when we look at those in need as an opportunity to feed them, we must not stop saying, oh, this is great, you've come to have a meal. We can say, this is great because you have come to have a meal and it has given us an opportunity to meet Jesus. To meet Jesus. Now why do I say that? I know you are answering the question already because Jesus said, when you feed me, or you feed the hungry, And so it's different for the church. It's different for us to be providers of food as well as people of faith. And we, the church, must not be tempted by the many needs that must be met in the world. We can be tempted by all the different things, all the different ministries that were called to participate in. They're all good ministries, they're all good projects, all the community efforts. We can be tempted to do all these different things. We must be very careful, for we are servants of God. We will never be God, but we are God's people. But we, so we know that we cannot meet all the needs that the world presents, but we need to be careful so we do not lose our identity, that we are faithful to what we are called to do, and we keep providing food that, if that's the issue or that's the problem we're trying to address, but doing it in a way that names us as Christians. When we look out at the world, we see there are many needs. And there are many seeds of doubt planted in our hearts. We look at the world and there's all these things that we, whoa, I can't do that. We can't, we can't find a way. We don't have the money. We, the seeds of doubt get planted. And we say to ourselves, oh, there's such great need and we're so small. We're, we're just not able to do that. And we're tempted by the great need and limited by our doubt. And the result can be nothing. We find ourselves just wringing our hands and we're not doing anything. We've got to be careful. But with the new understanding that Christ calls us to be Christ-like, not himself, we can turn the seeds of doubts into the fruits of faith. How do we do that? The temptation is to address all the needs. That's, that's a temptation. And it's a reality. We find ourselves tempted to address all the needs. And, and John Wesley himself said, do all you can. So we as Methodists, we try to pay attention to what Wesley says, do all you can. But this good advice can be dangerous if not performed with a faith orientation. And so we're getting ready to take another step in our faith as a church. We're getting ready to start providing regular meals back here at New Covenant again, hopefully on Tuesdays and Thursdays. We're working on all the details as time unfolds. We're part of this ad hoc organization called the East Hartford Hunger Action Team. We're, we're trying to address hunger collectively. We want to bring more food into our neighbor's home. But this is all very good, but we have to be careful, as I'm saying, as the body of Christ, we've got to be careful. We've got to make sure that we, that if, if, if that's all we're going to do, we're going to be food providers, and that, that's, that's good. But is that all we're called to be as the church? Yes, it's good to be food providers, but there's a great need for something else. You see, we're not in the business of turning stones to bread. That's not our job. There's a lot of people who do great work turning stones to bread. Food banks, food pantries, great people, wonderful people, Christians, Jews, Muslims, people of all faiths, doing that. That's important. That's part of the ministry, yes. But we also, as Christians, we must be mindful that we're in the ministry of Jesus Christ, which means we don't fall into the trap of worshiping the simple act of feeding. Do you understand what I'm saying? Yes. That, oh, that, this is all we do. We get, we got to do it this way, and, and, and if we don't do it this way, uh, you know, uh, sometimes we 
get so wrapped up in the details of the, of the act of feeding that we lose the joy of loving our neighbors. And so, so, this is why I pray that the name Soup Kitchen won't be used here when we're feeding. We're not going to be a soup kitchen. Again, I am not judging, I'm not criticizing. Soup kitchens serve thousands and thousands and thousands of people every day. Thanks be to God. But when I listen to the message of the gospel, when I listen to Jesus, he says do both. Yes. Feed it. Get food into the stomachs of your neighbors. But do that in a way that you can look into the eyes of your neighbor and say, you are not just a hungry person, Abigail. You are a child of God, and I look in your eyes, and I see and if I see Jesus Christ, I'm going to behave in a much different way than if I look at you and you are simply a hungry consumer. Don't get me wrong, we need these soup and cheese. But we also, we also, we also need to remind ourselves we need to be the church in all that we do. And all that we said. And that by hosting a meal, it ought to be different than going to a place that simply their mission is to provide food. And so we will not, I hope, call our community meals soup kitchen. But they are, <coughs> they are for all people to come to be cared for, to whether they come for the food or they come for the fellowship, but to be able to create this. This, this community that is counter to the temptation to follow in the paths of simply turning stones into bread. But Jesus could have done that, and there would be no problem with food, would there? But he said, you know, people do not just live with bread alone. There's other things that feed us. And by giving to just that, I'm going to be denying all the other opportunities to love and care for myself and my neighbors that may come and sit at that table. You see, there's a difference in our hearts. The devil would have been very happy with Jesus, would be very happy with us if we just simply dish out meal after meal, looking at our hungry friends as consumers. Oh, the devil would say, well, that's good, that's good, they're just feeding them. There's no, there's no love of God here, baby. Maybe there's no talk of Jesus. Maybe, oh, there's no following the will of God. Maybe, maybe it's just separate, take the food and move on. There's no development of relationships. There's no new friendships. There's no, 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 no growing of the body of Christ. The devil is not threatened by, by hungry people. The devil is threatened by people who turn seeds of doubt into fruits of faith. People who see and accept opportunity to do God's will resist evil. When you see opportunities to live out the gospel, that's what threatens the powers of evil. No matter how small they are. When you stand firm in your, as you remember from your baptismal vows, this is why they're, why they're so important to resist evil and to accept the power that God has given to you to, to go into the world and, and yes, maybe you're going to feed a brother or a sister in, but you're going to resist those powers that, that create that division between God's people and the world and between God and God's people. We need to move forward in our ministry together. But as we move forward, we, we must pay attention. And even though the, a lot of our partners, they're, they're wonderful partners, and, 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 we, and they, they, they expect a lot of the church, and they expect a lot of New Covenant, and, and, and there's things that, there's forms to fill out, and there's, there's grants to be applied for, and, and, and before you know it, you're wrapped up in all this important work that allows us to do good work. But, but please, pray for our hearts and our minds and our souls that we don't forget who we are. Amen. Don't forget who we are. Because I tell you and I will guarantee you, and it may be when I'm here or when I'm not here, there'll be someone coming to you and you'll be 
tend into the important ministry of feeding and someone will come to you and say, you know what? I've been coming here for three years. I know this is a church. But I've been here hungry for something else. And I just don't understand. I've been here for all these meals and, and no one said to me, are you hungry for anything else? Yeah. Have you ever thought about coming here on Sunday morning? How is it with your soul? I'm not asking everyone to be evangelists. I'm only asking you to be a Christian. Yeah. To pay attention. And for myself, talking to myself, you know, 95% of the sermons that I preach are to me, so. <laughs> pay attention. Look into the eyes the person you're having a meal with, you're sitting with, you're serving. Do you see Jesus? Do they see Jesus in you? Or are we about changing stones into bread? It's hard. Some days we'll be tempted and we'll be so busy changing stones into bread we'll forget who we are. That's why I'm asking you to remember who you are. Because this ministry is going to keep unfolding in new and powerful ways. But no matter what happens, everything that we do is in the name of Jesus Christ. <laughs> everything. You might not say that with every scoop of mashed potatoes or whatever, but everything we do, with every bagel that goes out, every loaf of bread, every vegetable, whatever it is that we're doing, we do it in the name of Jesus Christ, and we do that because that's what we're called to be, a people who walk a certain path, go in a certain direction, believe in a certain future, have hope in a cross, because there's something beyond the highest pinnacle in Jerusalem. There's something beyond all the kingdoms of the world. There's something beyond and that's what we hope for and wait for and expect. And something beyond is eternal life. That's why Jesus came to be with us, to show us a new way to live in preparation and to encourage others to, to feel the love and the depth of, of what Christ has to offer so that they will come and to live into that hope and freedom. It's transformative. It's a holy, transformative power, guided by the Holy Spirit and fueled by God's life-giving Spirit for us to take into the world. We are so equipped, but let us not forget who we are.